Um, as it was mentioned, I've been at Future Learn for six months, so I'm, I'm new to Future Learn, but I'm not new to online education. I did work at Wiley Education Services before this, which is an online program management provider, if you've heard of that, an OPM, um, helps universities with their recruiting and marketing and uh, retention for students, and so I worked with the University of Glasgow, University of Birmingham, University of Bath, and, and mostly in the UK. But I do have U.S. experience, too. I worked at the University of Pittsburgh, where I was director of online pro programs, uh, implemented their very first online asynchronous programs, as well as their very first MOOCs, back when MOOCs were, were brand new. Um, and for those of you who've been around e-learning for a while, I worked at eCollege, which was a, a very early learning management system, virtual learning environment, depending on, on how you call it. Um, so I've, I'm really excited to talk to you today about micro-credentials, kind of the next evolution of MOOCs and how this can help with continuous learning. So I just have three sections to my presentation. A quick introduction to future learn may be due to some of you. I'll talk about the movement from uh, MOOCs to micro-credentials and how we can use this to support continuing learning. Um, so raise your hand if you have heard of future learn. Oh wow, good. Um, that's great. So. FutureLearn, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about it. We were founded out of the Open University, and, and Open University is really one of the innovators in distance education. They did, in the very early days, they were doing TV and DVDs and correspondence uh, courses, more kind of in a blended format. And so when they call it the MOOC movement, that's what they call it back at the office. Uh, when the MOOC movement kind of started, uh, the Open University felt like they wanted to have a British response. And I'm not British. I, I could fake my British accent. It's terrible. Um, but they wanted to have a British response to the, the MOOC movement. So, and so Future Learn was born. Um, and here's a little bit about our reach. We have about 10 million learners, but as you can see, we're mostly outside of North America. Um, I'm the first person to work in North America, so my territory is all of North America. I take care of our partners, try to get new ones, and so any question you have, it, it's me. It comes back to me. Um, but you'll see that 88% are outside the U.S. A lot of them are from the U U.K., of course. I think we're a little different from others in that we have 60% of our users are female. I think that's a lot related to the topics that we have on FutureLearn. We do focus on digital and business, of course, because you need those for a career, career progression, but we also do a lot with healthcare, global health, and uh, teaching. So we have kind of a more diverse portfolio. Um, last year, 2018, the Open University decided they wanted to do more with Future Learn, and so we went looking for an investor. And so we did find an investor, the Seek Group. This was announced in April, actually a week after I started. This was announced that we were going to be 50-50 owners, the Seek Group and uh, Open University. So Seek Group, if you haven't heard of it, is a kind of a job board company. It's big in Australia, and they have uh, market leadership position in 14 other countries like China, uh, Mexico, Vietnam. Um, so really, they are a great partner for us because they can give us lots of insight into what kinds of careers people are going to be needing and what kind of skills from all that job information. So depending on who you ask, we either got 50 million pounds of money or we either got 65 million dollars. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a lot to get us started. We've been doing a lot with it already. Um, so at SEEK gives us kind of the commercial expertise and they try to help people move forward with their professional careers. And the Open University, of course, has always been about open access for all. And our mission at Future Learn remains to transform access to education. And so that's really our focus. So I hope that gives you a good sense of kind of where we've come from. We did start at the very beginning of the MOOC movement with, with edX and with Coursera and with the others. Um, and now, like many of our, our colleagues, uh, we're all changing to kind of a micro-credential model, kind of a more tangible pieces of content that can be used for career progression, but also for lifelong learning. So the word MOOCs, the first time I saw the word MOOCs or heard the word MOOCs, I was at the University of Pittsburgh. If you know about the University of Pittsburgh, it's a very traditional institution. They don't move quickly, they move very slowly, very deliberately. Um, and I thought, well, we're never gonna do that. <laughs> we're never gonna do that at Pittsburgh. 
Uh, turns out we were one of the first 32 to go online with Coursera, and I had a chance to really get in at the beginning of developing some, some MOOCs. And they had five MOOCs then, and they have five MOOCs now. Um, a lot of universities do a lot more with MOOCs, and, but it's a great place to start. And I wanted to share this clip. It was kind of uh, the UK's announcement and introductions to, to MOOCs, and I think they have a, a really funny take on, on their enthusiasm for a new way of teaching. Now, supposing that instead of going to live in some crummy bedsit in pot noodle land, so you can have the privilege of listening to a burned out hack give the same lecture he's been delivering for the last 20 years, suppose instead of that you could stay at home and hear some of the best lecturers in the world. The idea of MOOCs, massive open online courses, seems to some to promise a new future for higher education, an alternative to an expensive traditional one. So I love that because you can just tell they're really excited about uh, new opportunities for education for all in a very open format. Um, but it's true cause, because MOOCs were really part of a, a wider shift in the market. Um, for me at Pitt, I saw that everybody wanted to participate in this, this MOOC initiative. They wanted to give access to their materials at a global le level and create these global learning communities. I mean, people had a lot of uh, excitement about MOOCs at the beginning, and, and some of those ha uh, have been met, while others would say MOOCs are now dead. Um, I don't think we always call them MOOCs anymore. We call them open courses at FutureLearn, but the idea is still there, and I think uh, MOOCs really paved the way for a lot of progress and growth and acceptance of distance learning in general. So it's been a really great thing. So I pulled this from Class Central and just, I was wondering, you know, how many MOOCs are there anyway? And it's just grown exponentially over time, which is fascinating. It shows that it's really getting entrenched. This is from Class Central as well, and I think they're here somewhere. Um, 101 million students in over 11,000 different courses. And the thing that's really interesting to me is that this is, this is a global initiative. It started with the UK and the US, and, but now there are MOOC providers all over the world that have kind of their own slant on how MOOCs are offered. And I think we're all part of a, a global community. So what next? Um, we've, we've kind of broken the ground with having all these open courses and um, most of the providers are now changing and kind of monetizing. You can still find the open courses, but then there's sometimes a paywall if you want to keep your access. We're all transitioning to kind of micro-credentials and degrees and um, more tangible ways of learning. Um, this came, this came out yesterday, but it's based on an article that came out about a month ago from Pearson. If you haven't read it, I think it's, it's a definitely a good read, an easy read. Um, it's a global learner study and just talks about the changing dynamics and changing interests of learners. And so basically this 19 country survey found that uh, interest, there's now interest in shorter programs, lifelong learning. Uh, people don't have time for to get a master's degree when really all they need is one little piece of, of skills uh, to move forward in their career. So this whole dynamic and moving more quickly is really changing and reshaping um, higher education, or it will if it's not already. And so I, I pulled this off of... Um, YouTube actually, and it's from Kelly Services, and they're a job board, not job board, they're a uh, temp agency, and so they hire people, and it talks about uh, the importance of upskilling, this upskilling movement, and that it's moving from being an employer responsibility to while it's still often employer funded, it's now becoming an employee responsibility. So individual employees are looking for the skills that they need. So I'll play this real quick. Not so long ago, we wanted a job for life. Most of us were happy to work in the same job for the same organization until retirement. How things have changed. In a recent global survey, 60% of workers are considering or actively seeking further education or training. What's driving this? Workers are upskilling in order to gain a promotion, to make an advancement with a new employer, or to enter a new field of work. Across the Americas and the Asia Pacific, a promotion is the main reason for upskilling. While in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, workers are almost equally motivated by switching jobs or fields entirely and to prove everything old is new again. Today, Gen Y is more likely to be motivated by the prospect of a promotion with their current employer than Gen X or even baby boomers. So which fields are upskilling? 
Workers in maths, engineering, and IT are the most likely to upskill, outweighing those in science, healthcare, and education. And what's the best means of skill development in today's workers' eyes? 70% say on-the-job experience, 58% say continued education, while just 26% value seminars and webinars. The responsibility for skills development is shifting from employer to employee. The good news for employers who invest in training and education is this investment is a key motivator for valuable staff to stay and maybe one day collect that gold watch. So that talks a little bit about the changing dynamic in, in workers looking to upskill and this continuing this idea of continuing learning. And another study from Learning Solutions Magazine suggests that the continuing learning, learning benefits learners, but it also benefits employers. So the learning, learners are gaining skills and moving forward in their career. The employers, if they're funding these, are gaining employees who want to stay, and they're not having to having so much turnover. And so it's really a good thing for both on the business side.